So we're going to talk about, we talked diagnosis pulmonary embolism, now we're going to treat it. And we're going to focus on the current trends uh, of pulmonary embolism. It's a hot subject on the in-service exam and boards nowadays as well. Okay. Okay, I have nothing to disclose. I don't know about you, every time I hear that sentence, I feel like some sense of resentment in the speaker. So like, how come nobody pays me to talk about these products? So you'll hear about a lot of products today. Now I'm not, I don't have any relation with any of them. And sometimes you, you, maybe the speaker trying to say, uh, you know, you can offer me something or, <laughs> or it happens that his boss giving the next talk, so he's trying to give him a hint, 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 the Lumsden. I'm just kidding, guys, I'm glad you're still awake. Okay. There you go. So, pulmonary embolism, it's bad. It's the most preventable cause in hospital death, and the first manifestation can be fatal. We talked about massive, submassive, and minor, and we'll use this terminology throughout the talk. Let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism, and then you will understand the whole treatment and why we have to be aggressive. Pulmonary em uh, embolism increases the pressure in the pulmonary artery, increasing the resistance. That causes the right ventricle pressure overload. That, in, in turn, causes right ventricle hypokinesis and dilatation, decreasing the right ventricle cardiac output, now, and pushing the septum towards the left ventricle. Now, the right ventricle, sending less blood to the left ventricle and make it smaller. What's going to happen? The cardiac output will do, drops, and then you will have systemic hypotension, which causes coronary uh, hypoperfusion. But at the same time, that heart is distended. That's asking actually more oxygen demand with less perfusion. That will cause ischemia. And it's a circle, so it's going to keep continuing until the patient goes into heart failure. And the most life-threatening uh, uh, event of pulmonary embolism is when you have a large thrombocyte that causes hemodynamic instability like we saw. So what's the significance of that right ventricle dysfunction? First, the presence of right ventricle hypokinesis was associated with 57% higher mortality at three months, even though most of the patients, about 90%, were hemodynamically stable. And right ventricle to left ventricle ratio, more than 0.1, is shown to be an independent predictor of mortality. And the higher the ratio, the higher the rate of mortality. And patients with enlarged uh, uh, right ventricle, they have a higher, significantly higher chance of developing complications. We haven't paid the bills, or okay. So a uh, patient with right ventricle dysfunction, which wasn't resolved uh, prior to discharge, compared to those who resolved, they have eight times chances of developing venous thromboembolic events. And patient presented with acute PE and elevated right ventricle pressure, uh, uh, pressure that treated with heparin alone, they had continuous worsening symptoms, which are dyspnea, rest pain, exercise intolerance within six months. So the chest guidelines for treatment of pulmonary embolism if it's massive, again, high hemodynamic instability, IV thrombolytics, which 100 milligram TPA over two hours. That's a very large uh, dose of TPA. Uh, then you can use the endovascular embolectomy and pharmacomechanical intervention as a adjunct, and last resort, surgical embolectomy. For the submassive PE, we have right ventricular strain, however hemodynamically stable, with systemic anticoagulation still the guidelines for treatment, and we'll see why we should change that. So this is one of the uh, recommended algorithms for submassive PE. If the patient have diagnosed submassive PE with biomarkers, imaging, and physical examination, and there's no contraindication for uh, thrombolytics, give them the thrombolytics, which is high dose. If there's contraindication, go ahead with the catheter-directed thrombolysis because it's lower dose. And if it's, it's contraindicated, consider surgical embolectomy. And if the patient is have high comor it's a high comorbidity procedure, so if the patient won't tolerate that, just put IVC filter. <coughs> However, with those patients who pre-screened and found not to be high risk for bleeding, still 20% of them bled after administration of IV thrombolytics, including 3 to 5% of intracranial hemorrhage. So as you see, ruling out just not being high risk doesn't mean that they won't bleed. So there were uh, case series uh, 
uh, reporting about the catheter directed thrombolysis. In this series, for example, they treated 96% of their patients with catheter directed TPA, and they found 86% of the patient have resolution of their symptoms with only 2-4% complication rate. And it makes sense. This study was done in Germany uh, on dogs, don't kill the messenger. Uh, they they, they uh, ligated one of the pulmonary arteries and they injected the dogs with the grinded glass pieces. And they found within half a second, all the blood went to the open pulmonary artery, which makes sense, the, the pressure gradient. The blood will prefer to go towards the open side. So if we give TPA, where is it gonna go? It's gonna go to open artery, not the, the occluded artery. So what are the treatments for catheter directed? What are the modalities? One of the things is a pigtail rotation catheter, is to put the catheter into the clot and pulmonary artery and rotate it, macerating the clot. But this maneuver has high embolism rate, uh, so you have to use it with adjunct with aspiration thrombectomy or distal balloon occlusion. And Jujet, uh, it's you heard about it, it's a suction catheter. It sounds very tempting, however, there is a black box warning not to be used with a pulmonary embolism. It can cause fatal arrhythmia and embolism, further embolization. There are catheters that, uh, they're uh, high speed aspiration catheter, that, that, like the helix thrombectomy and the Asperex catheter. They're approved for AV graft thrombectomies and they're used off label for pulmonary embolism. The only FDA approved treatment is catheter directed thrombolysis and can be infused directly through a multi hole catheter or with ultrasound accelerated catheter. And if you, compare, when, if you compare both, it showed that the ultrasound accelerated catheter, the thrombus that's exposed to the ultrasound waves, has 90% increase in the TPA absorption within four, four hours. How does it work? The ultrasound waves, they, uh, they, they, they spread the fibrin uh, fibers, incre increasing the exposure surface of the thrombus. At the same time, it pushes the medication further, deeper into the clot, which causes better efficacy and faster resolution of the clot. Sorry, asking that. Without the hemolysis or the valve damage that can be caused by the other catheters like the NGJET. And this is a series uh, here, was done here at Baylor, uh, small series of 25 patients where they compared the ECOS to just the catheter, uh, the regular catheter directed thrombolysis, and they found that 100% removal of the thrombus with the ECOS with no hemorrhage, which was superior. And this is a larger series in JVIR, same thing, they uh, treated 60 patients, and they found that they significantly reduced the TPA introduced it through the catheter, decrease the pulmonary artery pressure, and they have very low complication rate. However, the game changer was the, the first random, randomized clinical trial was done by ECOS, which called the Ultima. They randomized two groups. One group received ECOS catheter with heparin therapy, and the other group just heparin therapy, the standard. 80 units per kilogram bolus, and continue with 18 kilogram, uh, units per kilogram per hour. And they showed the greater red, uh, reduction in right ventricular dysfunction in the ECOS group with decreased the ratio of the right ventricle to left ventricle and with no, uh, no significant difference between death or bleeding between heparin or the TPA catheter directed. So it the Ultima, the Ultima study concluded that fixed dose, low dose TPA catheter directed thrombolysis is effective and safe. And then they took it furthermore. The, the Ultima included only the submassive PE. They did the Seattle 2, where they involved actually the massive PE with the hemodynamic instability, instead of giving them the IV thrombolytics, the 100 milligrams. And this, this time they treated 150 patients, and they looked for the efficacy and safety of that. Uh, the, uh, the primary efficacy was to see the change in the right ventricle to left ventricle ratio over CT scan, and then to see the change in pulmonary artery pressure over echocardiogram after 48 hours, and the safety is still the same. They, they looked for major bleeding within 72 hours after the procedure. 
and it still showed significant reduction in the left ventricle to right ventricle uh, ratio and reduction in the pulmonary artery pressure and zero cases of intracranial hemorrhage. So this is what we call the game changer. Now we found that is efficient, safe, and effective uh, to perform catheter-directed thrombolysis, especially this one with ultrasound accelerated. This is a case we performed here we, in the Methodist Hospital. A 40-year-old uh, male patient who was traveling from Kentucky to Houston, he presented to the, he developed shortness of breath at the end of the trip, but decided to show up the next day to the ER. He is hypercoagulable. Physical examination, a little bit tachycardic, blood pressure. Um, normotensive on the low side with some hypoxemia, 92%, 94%, uh, with some chest pain. Chest troponin showed, again, the biomarkers that there is a left ventricle strain elevated and definitely got a CT scan that showed pulmonary embolism, bilateral. Echocardiogram showed right ventricle and left ventricle strain with paradoxical septal movement. We took the patient to the angio suite, started with pulmonary angiogram. You see the thrombus in the left and the right pulmonary arteries. We placed the ECOS. I was explaining to some of the uh, uh, residents yesterday at, in the Mighty that this picture is important if the patient becomes cardiopathic or you're not sure why they're not getting better. Another plain chest x-ray compared to this one and see if your catheter dislodged out of the pulmonary artery. This is how the patient will look like. It will come out with three drips, TPA, coolant, and heparin saline with two sheaths in the groin and two adapters. That patient, post-operative day one, the tachycardia and hypoxia improved within 13 hours, and the ultrasound showed only right peritoneal popliteal DVT because the most probably the proximal DVT broke and caused that DVT. Repeat echo, normal. EF, return back to normal to 60 to 64%. Back then, we used to do a completion angiogram. We don't do this anymore. If the echogram is normal, just pull the catheter bedside. But this is the pulmonary angiogram, selective showing resolution of the thrombus in the left pulmonary artery and in the right pulmonary artery. A uh, new trend of the uh, pulmonary embolism treatment is the angiovac. It's an extracorporeal cis, uh, circle that you place a large 20 French sheath in the internal jugular vein down into the SVC and pulmonary artery, and they complete the circle with another catheter in the femoral vein. You suction the, uh, the, the thrombus, which is mixed with saline and goes into a centrifusion, uh, what's called the uh, casket, and it separates the, 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 the clot from the blood. You filter the blood and you give it back into the patient. This is what you retrieve with the angiovac, very large uh, thrombus. We can talk about treatment of PE without talking about IVC filter. So the, the indication for IVC filter is recent proximal DVT or PE plus absolute contraindication to full anticoagulation. That's the only indication. The controversial or the soft indications of IVC filter, if you have large load of DVT with poor cardiopulmonary reserve, as we talk, the patient's not gonna tolerate the next PE, or recurrent uh, venothromboembolism despite therapy, or just for intracranial hemorrhage, which is a contraindication, just primary prophylaxis. A recent uh, publication in the JAMA showed despite placement of retrieval filters, 58% of those retrieval filters are not retrieved. Favorite, favorite question on the general surgery and the vascular boards. Uh, DVT and PE in pregnancy. I got that on my vascular oral boards. Pregnant uh, female with most probably hypercoagulable or immobility or uh, twins. Uh, she will show up with, with a swollen leg, the usual. We go with risk factor, physical examination, ultrasound, ultrasound show DVT. The answer is admit the patient to the hospital, elevate the leg, start on heparin. Now you transition the heparin to Lovenox. No Coumadin, it's teratogenic, and no new agents. Zoralto, Eliquis, our question. You have to uh, plan for C-section so you can stop the Lovenox 24 hours before surgery. 
continue six weeks after the delivery and repeat hypergoal workup. Future directions, uh, so what should we do? How can we prevent this fatal, uh, most preventable uh, disease? We started this uh, task force at the Methodist West Hospital, multidisciplinary approach for PE. Any patient with submassive PE uh, with right ventricle strain and uh, systolic blood pressure above 90, how do I identify those? We start by clinical suspicion like we talked about physical examination, uh, biomarkers, and if they're positive, we get a CTA PE with instruction to the radiologist that we already provided them that we're looking for the right ventricle to left ventricle ratio with a clot burden for the septum uh, bulging into the left ventricle. If they are positive, we obtain a st stat echocardiogram that will be read by the cardiologist on call within 30 minutes. Once that identified, the patient will receive heparin and we will admit it to the ICU. Our critical care and myself will be called, uh, when, uh, which our critical care is uh, uh, our pulmonologist running the ICU, and then one will, de will determine IV thrombolytics versus catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis versus anticoagulation alone. So in conclusion, PE is lethal and preventable. Right ventricle dysfunction is the main cause of the death, usually within hours of the acute embolic events. That's why we started that uh, response team that I just explained. Anticoagulation stops further uh, uh, thrombus formation, but not, does not resolve it. The body itself resolves it. And 33% of the patient will have ongoing right ventricle dysfunction at seven days. And we saw how morbid that is. Systemic thrombolytics, they work. However, they have high chance of bleeding, and it's in very high dose. Catheter-directed thrombolysis, it showed that it's effective with very low dose of TPE, TPA and um, with low complication rate. Improves the right ventricle function, takes out the comorbidity out of the PE, and reduces significantly the thrombolytic, uh, the TPA dose uh, from 100 to almost uh, 15 milligrams.